Hello, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. If my voice is not familiar to you, that is because I am not show host and Whistlekick founder, Jeremy Lesniak. My name is Jared Wilson, and I get to be the special guest host for this episode. We'll get more on that later. If the entire universe of Whistlekick is new to you, or if you haven't been there in a while, go on over to whistlekick.com to see all the amazing things Jeremy is doing. If you want to support the show and you do make a purchase over there, make sure to use the code PODCAST15 at checkout to get 15% off. It also lets Jeremy know that the podcast is a useful form of advertising, that it is the way that he's attracting people to uh, Whistlekick. If you're looking specifically for martial arts radio stuff, they have their own website. It's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you know Jeremy, that fits his bill perfectly. He's very big on creative uh, website titles. If you go over there, you can see all the amazing things Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio does, all the things that are there to meet the goal of connecting, educating, and entertaining. If you want to specifically support the show and you want to make a purchase, like we talked about, or you can tell a friend, that's an easy one. Make a recommendation to a friend, uh, put up a review on a podcast hosting site, or if you really want to go in there, we could join the Patreon. You can become a Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio patron. Just go to patreon.com slash whistlekick. When you do so, you can start off as low as $2 a month. For $5 a month, you get a bonus episode. For $10 a month, you get a bonus video. And the value increases from there. So that sounds like a great deal. The more you pay, the more you get. Now, why am I here? I'm here because I used to host a podcast called Martial Thoughts Podcast. Again, not the greatest names, but it works. Uh, I've since retired it, and Jeremy and I became friends over that. Not over the retirement, over the podcast. I had an old guest, uh, Ellis Amder Sensei, reach out to me and say, hey, I've written a new book. I had interviewed him twice. And he is such an amazing author and uh, illustrious person in the martial arts that I thought we still needed to have his voice out there in some form. So I contacted Jeremy. We've been friends for years. I said, hey, I've got this idea about doing an interview as kind of a, a, a reporter for you. He said, that sounds awesome. Let's see how this goes. So I interviewed Ellis Amder on his new book, Little Bird and the Tiger which is a martial arts historical fiction, which sounds unusual when you think about it, but it also makes perfect sense. I'm going to let him tell you about the book. We go deep into the history of the setting. So I'm going to let him tell you about that and we'll let him speak about it. What I'd really love to talk to you today about is your book, right? I got it right here. Yay. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Little Bird and the Tiger, which, first of all, is a, a kind of an interesting title. It's it's one of those that's like, you're not quite sure what that means. So it's a fiction book, which is, again, a little bit unusual for uh, a martial arts to talk about. But if you had to give the elevator pitch for the book, how would you describe what the what the book is? Well, That's kind of the way I, I felt can... about it, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I can give the elevator pitch, but uh, the overriding theme of the book is moral injury. Uh, mm-hmm. And moral injury is a term which is used to describe the trauma one uh, in, incurs from what one does, not what's done to you. And, you know, actually, you know, in my work with uh, veterans, in my professional work, that's something that a lot of therapists don't understand uh, that uh, more now, but back in the early days, people were often experiencing PTSD from what they had to do or what they found themselves doing, not because something bad happened to them, right? And so that that's the term for that is moral injury. Um, you got two characters and this, this book is set in 19th century Japan, which was, uh, um, this incredible transition of uh, feudal Japan becoming modern in a very short period of time. And Japan had to become modern 
because every, they were observing every other country in Asia was swallowed up by the West. You know, every other country was either colonized, forced treaties like in China. Um, and Japan's solution was uh, they attempted to resist the West. And then they said, we're going to kind of embrace the West. We're going to take whatever we can to use from the West while trying to retain being Japanese. And to do that, Japan became a colonial power. Now, I don't mean by that that this was uh, like an innocent act that they desperately had to do. There were a lot of choices, some of them horrible choices Japan did, that made them as evil a colonial power as any of the Western powers. Um, so that's sort of the, uh, um, the macro uh, sort of period of time. And the characters, one is, uh, I can go in more detail as we talk, but one is based on a, a real human being, Murakami Hideo, who was four generations back in Bukoryu Naginata, the, one of the styles that I train. And we know very little about her, even though we have photographs of her dating up to 1941. Um, she was a tiny woman. As best we know, when she was about 13 years old, she left her home. Uh, no one knows why, but she started traveling from dojo to dojo uh, sometimes training and apparently sometimes challenging the dojo for a place to sleep because that's how it was done in those days. You would approach the dojo uh, and ch uh, challenge them. Uh, and if you if you won and behave well, you might be uh, asked to stay and teach. If Even if you won, but if you behave poorly, the students might gang up on you and beat you. Uh, but here you have a young girl, not even a woman yet, who was doing this. It's not fiction. Um, we, I've actually found some newspaper records from the 1890s where she is listed on a playbill where she was getting up on stage and take, just with a bunch of weapons and taking challenges from the audience. Uh, and this is wooden weapons. This isn't, you know, like everybody armored up and things like that. So... What we had known was she lived alone and died alone. She could drink any man under the table. Uh, uh, one famous teacher, Otsubo Dyu, I think his last name was Yuho. I may forget his last name, but he was a Yagyu Shinkageyu teacher when I was in Japan. He remembered as a little boy sometimes bringing, being sent to bring her food or sake. You know, she lived uh, alone in a small little apartment. Um, so that's what little we knew. And then I found uh, uh, a man's graduate thesis, which really intrigued me. So Kobayashi Sensei's teacher, a uh, student, her, her final student was a woman named Kobayashi Seo. And from a very Japanese perspective, when she was young, she was considered an absolute beauty. And uh, I used to hear these old men, uh, it's getting a little drunk and I would mention I did book audio. Ah, Kobayashi Sensei, ah, Yakuri, ah, ah, Bijin da na. Which is like two old men saying, ah, that Kobayashi Sensei, she was a beauty, right? Um, and so there were, there's photos of Kobayashi Sensei training with this tiny little woman with a wrinkled walnut face, very severe looking woman. And uh, this would be pre World War II. And what Kobashi Sensei remembered was she was home. Her father was a very famous uh, teacher of uh, Itodio. I think it was, yeah, Hokushin Itodio. Um, and he was one of the first modernizers of Jap Japanese Budo. He started talking about we got to bring these things into the school system train the nation to be strong for, you know, the coming trials of whatever. Um, and one day, uh, Kobash says it was like six years old. This, to her eyes, elderly woman just walked into the house, grabbed her by the wrist, and just took her into the dojo, which is next door, and started teaching her Naginata, something she didn't want to do and she didn't like. But 
as you know, later fell in love with, et cetera, et cetera. And she became you know, Murakami Sensei's successor. Uh, now, I found a graduation thesis, uh, an obscure thesis written about Kobayashi Sensei's father. And, you know, I'm, I'm having one of these odd glitches in my brain. Uh, the, his name will come back to me. And it's a, it's a very famous name, so it's kind of embarrassing. But at any rate, uh, the author, I do remember the author of the thesis, which is Samuel Shuklin. And there were a couple sort of tidbits in this like thesis. The one is that it mentioned in a footnote that he was friends with Murakami Hideo, this Naginata teacher. Okay, that's interesting, right? Known. And the other was he went to this man's hometown and he was interviewing people. Now, this is, uh, you know, 150 years after his birth. And an elderly woman said, Oh, there was a scandal. He had an affair with a Naginata teacher. And Shuklin says, well, what was her name? Oh, I can't tell you that. That would be gossip. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and um, so another thing in the thesis that struck me was that this man was not buried with his family. He was buried in a separate burial plot. And so a thought came to me, um, you know, the, uh, I'm, I'm checking the name and see if I can find it right here. It's, it's really terrible that I don't remember his name. Oh, well, it, it, in the middle of the interview, it'll come back. Um, the thought came to me, what if he had an affair and she had a baby? Mm. Now, in 1910 Japan, a woman having a baby out of wedlock was worse than useless. Right. If she did not have a family to hide the scandal, she's all alone. On top of that, the child is the possession of the father and the father's family. So what I can imagine, what, what I, I have no idea if this is true, but what I imagined happening was, what if this father just took the baby, went to his wife and said, your baby, raise her. Mm -hmm. And a good Japanese wife would say, and do so. Right. And then two thoughts sort of, this would explain the family not burying him with uh, um, the, uh, the rest of the, on the family burial plot. And the other thing that struck me is, the only way this mother could touch her daughter was in martial arts practice. And this was a weapons practice, which meant they never touched each other. And the, the poignancy of that image uh, led me to create the first character uh, in the book, Tachibana Hideo, who is, it starts out roughly based on my imagination of what uh, this life would be like. Uh, and then I took it in some other directions. Um, the second character is uh, uh, made up, the second main character, if you will. And uh, um, oh, this is a young man, Umizawa, who is, I would guess, is based on probably 80% of the people listening to this broadcast, <laughs> which is at least 80, maybe more, which is every young man who wants to be a hero. Mm -hmm wants to once you know imagines reads about heroes sees heroes imagines himself being that person who isn't afraid to act always knows the right thing to do and such a human being such a young man is very susceptible to romance to influence and to manipulation mm -hmm. and a lot a lot of young men go to war based on the manipulation of older men. Right. Right. You see that all over the world today. We've always seen it. And so this was my second character. And I, I was able to explore then a phenomenon that was also a Japanese phenomenon, which was the Taidikudonin. And the Taidiku, the name literally means Taidiku's continent. And Ronin 
uh, basically is Ronin, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the masterless samurai. But in this context, the best real definition would be land pirates. The, these, were, these were Japanese citizens who went to Asia, some to seek adventure, some to seek booty, uh, uh, and not booty in the mo modern sense, but, you know, to, to, to get, although that might be part of it, but, but <laughs> you know, to, to, uh, yeah, riches, um, but it included every Japanese citizen, because what is really remarkable is that every Japanese who went to Asia, whether they knew it or not, was part of an inchoate spy network because every bit of experience they had would be told to somebody else, would go into a letter, and sooner or later it would get to somebody who was gathering that information. And there was this, from the very beginning of modern Japan, there was this uh, 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 intertwining of government agencies and informal um, citizen agencies, which were part terrorist, part espionage, um, and, and in fact, it's so to this day, but that's sort of another subject, but, but it still is so to some degree, but so there are these famous organizations, the first known as the Genyosha, the dark ocean society, uh, founded by a man named Toyama Mitsuru, uh, who is a character in the book. And I based, I based um, his character on all available information I could get in, you know, in different theses, different accounts of him. And the Genyosha was, you could almost think of it as a kind of Al-Qaeda, but far more successful because their terrorism was surgical. And it was to not like Al-Qaeda, which is in a sense um, a political organization that serves itself, seeing itself as, you know, ideally to take over the world, you know, under under the the uh, rule of, of its version of Islam. But the Genyosho was in service of its view of what the emperor needed and what the emperor needed to be. So they did everything from charity to terrorism. And they were remarkable in that respect. And from Genyosha, a bunch of other organizations sort of were spawned. Because uh, one of the remarkable things is uh, Japan, this aspect of Japan, there was this ability to, okay, we have another purpose. Rather than expanding the corporation, we form a new organization which has personal ties, but not organizational ties. And so Toyama's uh, most important disciple was a man named Uchida Ryohei. And Uchida Ryohei was, uh, I think, the first fifth on, I believe, in the Kodokan uh, in the 1890s. Uh, he did a number of martial arts. Uh, his, his very, very important in Shinto Muso Ryujo, the stick fighting style. And he formed the very famous Kokudyukai. And the Kokudyukai, that literally means the Black Dragon Society. And everybody, ooh, you know. But in this case, what Black Dragon really referred to was the Amur River, which in Chinese is referred to. Uh, I'm not even going to try to butcher, uh, butcher the pronunciation. But it literally means the Black Dragon River. And the Amur River is, I believe, the fifth longest river in the world. starts in Russia. And it goes along the border of what is now considered to be China. Uh, the Japanese from about 1890 envisioned a larger Japan, which would encompass uh, Korea, Manchuria, Mongolia, and Primorye, which is uh, uh, an area of uh, the so southeasternmost area of Russia, right above Korea. All of that was envisioned to be the future of Japan. And so this was a society to bring Japan to the Amur River. Um, so each of these societies um, had slightly different purposes, but their goal was um, to, you know, fulfill Japan's destiny, kind of a manifest destiny. 
in a way very similar to you know the United States Manifest Destiny, where we swept aside the people who were living there to make the modern United States. Right. Um, so Umezawa, this character, is a young man who becomes one of these adventurers, and basically his his arc goes from one area to another. He gets involved with the uh, um, the Aboriginal people, the the original people of southern eastern Russia, uh, the Nani, who refer to themselves as the people, uh, Korea, uh, Manchuria, and back into Japan. And so these characters at various points intersect. And that's sort of the arc of the story, which was a long elevator ride. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that's that's that, it's OK. So what I really liked about the book is. It, it It's weird in that there's not a continuous story through the whole thing. It's kind of like told in uh, pieces of adventure and they mm -hmm. don't at first kind of go together. But then again, you kind of see how it all leads to the same kind of conclusion. Mm -hmm. I also enjoyed how every single thing you were talking about, even though it's minimalistic description, there's like three layers of occurrences that's happening all at the same time. You know, it's almost like it's you're talking about one thing on the surface, but then there's other emotional and and I want to say manners, but uh, well, manners might be the best way to describe. It. There's mannerific things that are occurring that they're speaking through at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I also like that the characters are pretty flawed in their own ways too. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it even the 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 the, the Naginata uh, star pupil who ends up taking over the school, she screws up a couple of times socially and and has to apologize to people for it. You know, <laughs> so yeah, well, yeah, she's cursed with a couple of things. The one is, um, people today have absolutely no idea how profoundly constrained a Japanese woman would be and in that period of time and how revolutionary it was in one way or another to break those social bonds. Um, and the only way that this woman can come up to do so is to be absolutely inviolate, to be so strong that nobody can take her over, to be willing to die in the process rather than being in any way taken over. Yeah, but she has... She has that great line where she says, I have a male's name. I earned it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, and and, and that is, in fact, um, in Bukoryu, the actual school this is based on, when women would get uh, their teaching license, their name would be shifted to a male name. That, in fact, is true. Uh, so that my, my instructor, uh, Nita Suzuyo, used to be Nita Suzuko, which is a female name. And once she became a teacher, it becomes Suzuyo. And people have a hard time understanding this, but what it's basically saying is that in this realm, I am the equal of any male. It, it doesn't concern any of the sort of modern concerns that some people have about gender and things. It is fully within the Japanese context of what sexuality and gender is. But in this respect, as a teacher, um, I'm not lesser than what a male teacher would be. And in, in the cultural context, the only way to do that was to take that male sort of name. I, I'm curious if if you know the history of this, because it's one thing I've never really kind of gotten an idea on is how the Naginata actually became associated as a, a female weapon. Mm. Um, you know, I'm assuming it's sometime during the Meiji that it kind of like separated between sword and naginata. Um, just, it was earlier. Okay, so okay. It, um, the here's the elevator. <laughs> so, um, we don't even know exactly when the naginata was developed, but probably soon after the curved sword was developed. We're talking back in the Heian period, about mm -hmm. a thousand years ago, and the naginata was originally the foot soldier's weapon. Uh, you know, on the ground, you have a weapon that is heavy, that is powerful as a slashing, and you can stab with it kind of weapon. That was a weapon that was ideal for a foot soldier. Right. And one of the paradoxes when you consider battles in those days, um, 
there were never many horses in Japan because there's not not that much land to pasture horses. So horses quickly became uh, owned by aristocrats. Uh, because of the social construct of war at the time, when your leader who was on horseback got killed, the battle might be over. Or if some of the leaders got killed, the foot soldiers might be doing the killing. They might be killed in vast numbers, but they weren't important in determining victory or defeat. Right. So, you know, when you read the battle tales, you read about guys on horseback with uh, uh, bow and arrow and then sword. But there were vastly more foot soldiers. Um, sometime after Japan's uh, confrontation with the Mongol Empire during the Mongol invasions, which was the 1200s, uh, end of the 1200s, um, the conscript soldiers of the Mongols, who were largely Korean and Chinese, had spears. And J Japan had, for reasons that aren't exactly clear, abandoned the spear, which used to, previous to the curse, would be the primary weapon. The only thing that's suggested is um, that they used a socketed spear called a hoko, and the spearhead wasn't well secured to the shaft. Now, you can secure the, uh, a socketed spearhead very well to the shaft. I was recently on the island of Malta and was a guest and able to see the armory of the Knights of St. John and handle a lot of the weapons there. And, you know, they have uh, a lot of spearheads with long flanges down that are very tightly secured. But for whatever reason, the spear was largely dropped. It then came back in about the 1300s and increasingly supplanted every other weapon for foot soldiers. And that's when the Japanese developed formation fighting, which went then when they got firearms, you know, that it, they already had formation fighting, but they just added uh, musketeers to. Um, okay, some people still chose to use the Naginata. The Naginata um, had a specific use in certain armies. For example, Uesugi Kenshin, who was a famous warlord, had a squad of Nagamaki fighters. Nagamaki is like a, a, a either um, a long half-handled, half-sword, half-and-half weapon, right. or it's a giant Naginata. The terminology is unclear. But he had a, a squad of, I believe, 100 of these fighters who were probably the biggest guys in his domain who would basically be used to break a, a, a pike wall. Yeah, you know, it's very similar to the Landsneck in Switzerland and Germany that, mm -hmm. you know, when you have a formation of long pikes, long spears, you don't go stabbing it. You're basically bracing it as a wall, like a porcupine. And if you can break a hole in that wall, then you can charge in some among them. And so the Naginatu was probably used for that. Other people still use it in single combat. Now, largely at that time, we still have a manned weapon. <clears throat> but somewhere along the line, um, particularly probably in the frontiers when Japan was expanding itself amongst the islands, the Yamato people, um, women were left alone. Or you would have women had to be armed too uh, in a castle to fight a siege. Now, what weapons do you have that would be suitable for a woman? Uh, women were lesser strength, lesser size. Um, so the two weapons you would have would be the spear and the naginata. Um, the spear has a symbolic valence of number one, very phallic. Right. And number two, it was associated with the ashigaru, who were low-ranking warriors drafted from the peasantry often. So it was a weapon of violence. It was uncouth. So culturally speaking, this valence grew up around the naginata, that it was long, you could cut somebody at a distance, you wouldn't have to grapple with them, and it wasn't associated with the lowest of the low among your army. I want to use those peasant weapons. Yeah. Um, and so bit by bit, this cultural association grew up, and there were myths about certain famous women warriors who fought off a siege with the naginata or whatever. So at a certain point um, in the Edo period, which was this period of totalitarian peace, uh, 300 years of such a well-governed society that there was no war. Now, there was uh, a lot of capital punishment. There was not much crime. 
it was not a place that probably a modern human being would want to live in. But it was, as far as I can tell, the only successful true totalitarian uh, society. Um, it actually uh, got undermined to a certain degree um, with the rise of a merchant's class, because when capital starts to shift. I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, all of a sudden I've got a, a your your screen just froze for a few moments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, we're back now, I guess. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, when you have a rise of a merchant class, capital starts flowing away from the people in power. They get to be in hock to the people who are holding the note, so to speak, um, which led to a tremendous increase in actual culture because feudal societies tend to be rather static. So it was uh, it really enriched the culture but it undermined uh, those in charge. So what started to happen is those in charge um, made the katana, the sword, a symbol of rule. And so the bushi, the, the samurai class, about 5% of the population carried two swords. And that was as much as anything else, it's like the necktie of an office worker, right? <laughs> many of them didn't know how to fight. Many of them did, many of them didn't, but this was their authority. Um, and it also, it didn't only include, um, we will cut down those who defy the authority of the feudal domain. It also exemplified this sword was to serve the feudal domain, so it's a symbol of submission as well. Now, the woman's relationship to the man in that period was the woman submits to the man the same way the man submits to the feudal lord. And the symbol of their strength, because you submit with endurance. It's not submission like um, we usually think of submission as frail, weak, you know, like this, boneless. This was submission with strength, with dignity. You, you bear up your role under any level of stress, any level of harshness. And so the symbol of that was the naginata. And so women, when they married in the upper class, in the bushy class, would receive a naginata if they hadn't had one before. And if anything else, it would be hung up on the wall of the house and it symbolized her role as a mm -hmm. warrior woman in a sense. But a warrior woman didn't mean going to war, it meant perfect service. So in essence, that was, it wasn't really the go-to weapon in that sense, although in rural areas, sometimes the women of a village would have their own squad to, you know, confront intruders when the men were away working or something like that. Um, my Aikido teacher, Kuomori Yasunori's uh, great grandmother, was a member of a squad like that uh, in a rural village in, in Kyushu. You know, if a stranger came to town, all the women would grab their naginata and they'd confront him. Uh, <clears throat> The actual weapon, which was most symbolic, though, of women was a kaiken, which was a, a, a short dagger without a handguard. And it had two purposes. There's one purpose of self-defense, but the real purpose was that you would be able to commit suicide. Uh, if you were in danger of being dishonored, um, you could take your own life. And it wouldn't be seppuku, which was cutting the belly, which is what men did. You would cut the carotid artery, which would be a quick death, and you could die with dignity in theory. Right. right. Um, so th that was how the Naginata began to be associated with women. Then as the Edo period progressed, um, it became the either the gateway weapon when women would join some gyu. That would be the first weapon they would learn. For example, Maniwa Nenyu, men would start with the sword. Women mm -hmm. would start with the Naginata. They would eventually learn other weapons. But then what started to happen is you'd have specialty schools, which would just specialize in a weapon. And so then you had the development in the late Edo, really, of Naginata specialty schools, uh, which became more and more associated with women. Never exclusively, but more associated with women. Would, I'm just asking a weird question here. Was that part of the them taking the male name is so that they could have, you know, quote, male students that wouldn't be taking lessons from a woman? Would that was mm -hmm. that part of that? No, no, it's uh, it's you know, I, I, um, it's a lot more sophisticated than that. Um, okay. It's just generally you take that name, you're asserting fully your role as a Shihan 
teaching martial arts, undeniably the equal to other Shihan. Gotcha. So, you know, you know that's now their, their students might be all women. And as, as time passed into the Meiji period, the Naginata schools generally associated mostly with women, you know, so um, in, total, in, in, in what we call Tenshin Bukoryu, the school that I'm associated with, uh, I am the first male to get a teaching license since 1910. <laughs> and so there was one guy in 1910, and before that, we don't know of any males before 1860. Okay. So since then, um, we've had in Bukodu quite a few males. In fact, right now, the uh, Soke Daidi, the head of our school, Ken Sorensen, uh, is obviously male. But yeah. Um, the other weapon that's used a bit in your book mm -hmm. is the Kusare Gama, which is another one of those kind of outlier weapons in, in Japanese history. If, if for anybody that doesn't know what it is, it's a uh, a sickle, like a kama, but then it's got a weighted chain on one end that's mm -hmm. used for both striking and entangling, from my understanding. Right. Um, and, and you even mentioned in the book, it's like, we don't really know where this came from. It just kind of showed up because, honestly, it's, it's a crappy battlefield weapon. You can't swing it around. You'd be hitting everybody. Yeah. So... <laughs> Is that part of the your your traditional schools that you're part of as well? Then, yeah, but both of the schools I train, uh, Tenshin Bukoryu and Arakiru, we have Sarigama used oh, rather okay. differently. Okay, so um, <laughs> it's possible that some warriors took Sarigama with them on the battlefield, and okay. but it's like in World War One. A lot of parents or others bought their son a trench knife, which was a, almost like a small cutlass with a knuckle duster on it. This was not official army kit. Right. But this was, if things get really extreme, <coughs> you'll have this. So um, Japanese combat when up to 1600s, which is when combat, uh, you know, traditional combat ended, Again, we had at that time we had, you had muskets, you had spears. Um, the sword was an auxiliary weapon. Uh, a few people still carried naginata, and there was still bow and arrow. Okay, and that was pretty much the battlefield kit. Now, almost every warrior had a dagger of some kind, maybe more than one, on his belt, and that was when things get close, you grab and stab. Mm -hmm. And these go by such names as kumi uchi. Torite, Kogusoku, and these are all names for close combat with a dagger. Right. Okay. Um, now, theoretically, it wouldn't be that much to add a Kusarigama to your kit. And you're going, okay, uh, my spear breaks. Um, I'm in a melee. I've got a little space. I can clear some space whirling this thing around, and I could use it until I can take another proper weapon off somebody I've either killed or, you know, I have space that I can grab a weapon on the ground. So in theory, that's possible. Um, but there's, and in my book, Old School, I go into considerable detail about um, what are the theories of how it developed and where, et cetera. Um, what's I think very interesting is um, it shows up, number one, in rural uh, martial arts, sort of uh, more country arts. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a real interpenetration between something called bonote, is a generic term for it, which basically means hand and stick. And so the gyuha, the martial arts were associated with the warrior class, but they started to filter down into other classes pretty early, pretty early, okay? Um, the Gyuha were not, as many people assert, just basic training for war. They were using techniques originally created on the battlefield to inculcate the role of being a bushi in a period of peace. Right? 
There was some change that as time progressed, instead of these what's called Sogo Bujutsu, where there's a lot of weapons, probably the majority of you just focused on the sword, right? Because that suited what kind of combat you would be in. And what started to happen is the way the practice was executed became somewhat formalized as befitting the role of a bushi. Now, Bonote is a peasant kind of um, martial dance fight style um, that was practiced, enacted mostly at Matsuri festivals. And it's really flamboyant. It's, I mean, they got this cool stuff like a guy will charge in with a metal, a, a, an edge spear and the guy who has a straw hat ducks the hat down and the spear pierces the straw hat. And then he replies with a, you know, a slash with a sword and they're bouncing all around. It's real peasant stuff. OK, um, it'd be very undignified for a warrior, a uh, bushi to do that. Right. But if you think about it. What the bushi did. Did not alone prepare somebody to go onto a battlefield. What these farmers were doing wouldn't prepare them to go on a battlefield. But in both cases, they're regularly practicing with weapons. They're handy, they're wieldy. It would take very little to retrofit either party into a combative unit. Just like, you know, the Boy Scouts is not a martial art, but I remember, I don't know if it's still true, but 50% of special forces personnel in, were in the Boy Scouts. Right. So it really prepares you for a bunch of things that you, you have to have if you're going to be a special operations uh, individual, including independence, resourcefulness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Right. So in the rural communities, the, the far from center of power communities, there's a real interpenetration between these peasant arts and the samurai arts. And so the Arakiru, which I train, is a perfect example of that that um, it's really rough, sometimes ugly, and it uses weapons like Sarigama with pretty flamboyant techniques that you wouldn't expect to see in an art like uh, Yagyu Shinkage-ryu or uh, onahai ryu which are all about hinkaku, about dignity and, you know, this sort of thing, right? Right. So that's, that's one aspect of Sarigama really was uh, uh, present in the rural areas. Now, the other thing which I find kind of an interesting paradox is you see it in a lot of Naginata schools. And uh, I actually wrote an, uh, an essay about this in on my, I have a website where I write about uh, sort of short essays on martial arts and I also get guest writers to come. It's called kogenbudo.org. Um, and I wrote an essay on the, okay. Cool. Um, I wrote an essay on the frequency in which you will find the Kusarigama um, in Naginata schools. And I started to think, why? And then I thought about Bukoryu, where this exists. And the one thing is, women at that time had a lot less opportunity than men to train hand-eye coordination, particularly in regard to flying objects. Right? They didn't do ball games. They didn't, it'd be unlikely, except in the country where they'd be throwing clods of dirt at each other or anything like that, right? <laughs> right. So what the Kusarigama introduces is an object that flies at you from various spacing, various timing, various arcs. And so you really train yourself to be able to judge in that fraction of a second, could this hit me, could this not hit me? It trains a person in courage if they haven't, experienced things flying at them and there's a natural flinch reaction something comes at your face right, right? um it also trains in uh precision because the truth is once you can't pass the flying object then you have a sickle against a naginata that's not a good match right. but in the kata you are supposed to not smash the person in the head is supposed to come to uh, a neutralized one way or another. It neutralizes at the end, right? 
Mm -hmm. And so it teaches the person control of a heavy weapon so that they don't, in many cases, hit their senior in the head, which would uh, be a bad thing. So it creates a situation that artificially imposes a set of tensions on the practitioner on both sides, um, which, you know, whether the idea of actually fighting a, a naginata against a skilled person with a kasarigama, you know, no. it, it is a formidable thing for a sword fighter, but mm -hmm. against the naginata, no, um, it's just too long and too heavy, but it, there's a lot of training value that comes in that matching, which I think, was necessary to fully train women uh, who were, again, the bulk of the people practicing in Naginata exclusive schools then. Yeah, you, you had the character in the book almost, you know, kind of say that type of thing that, yes, it could be an effective weapon, but it was more about the training aspect of it than the weapon itself. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so kind of going back to what we originally started talking about with the moral uh, injury, right? The, the kind of the, the inspiration for the book here. Uh, and, and I appreciate the the history. That answers a bunch of questions. I've always kind of had rolling around in my head. So I, I do appreciate that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, you know, as you were talking about, I guess it's because we have the hindsight of we know kind of, you know, as the Meiji Restoration happens, Japan becomes, like you said, more and more imperial. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, colonial as well. We know that kind of culminates into World War II, into this like hyper imperialism. And then there's the after effect right after World War One, where they're like, uh, there's almost like an, an, an anti imperialism a aspect of it. And it's kind of feels like that moral injury is for the whole country at that point. It's like, well, now we have to deal with what we did as a country. Yes and no. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, In a way, there, spiritually speaking, one of the terrible things that the, the atomic bombs did is it allowed Japan to feel itself a victim because it was such a cataclysmic single act creating that much decimation that until recent years, if you went to Hiroshima, uh, or Nagasaki uh, to look at the, uh, I think it's Hiroshima, I've been to the memorial for atomic bomb. Until recently, there was no mention of what Japan did in Korea. It was like somehow this bomb happened to us as victims. And, and so what, unlike Germany, and all these things are flawed, but unlike what happened in Germany, where there was a, a clear moral reckoning, uh, what happened in Japan was there was this moment of terrible shock when the emperor surrendered. Right? Um, but before there was a chance for Chinese people to talk about the open air Auschwitz, which was northern China, the medical experiments, the fact that there is people are still dying to this day from bacteria from medical experiments in unit 731 in northern China, because some areas of the soil were seeded with anthrax spores. Right? Um, before that could happen, the communists took over China, who imposed their own terrible rule. Right. And the American response was, Okay, an end to this democracy. We'll continue to, you know, because America still controlled Japan at the time. So what we did is all of a sudden the people that we were calling war criminals, with the exception of a few, the majority of them then became the leaders of post-war Japan. Okay, so the liberal Democrat party is neither liberal or Democrat. Um, <laughs> is composed of the same class that successfully prosecuted World War II. Not the idealistic, uh, like some of the people I, I talk about in my book, not the Toyama Mitsuru. They were useful, but as often happens, the idealistic fanatic 
who can be terrible in their own right, but they're useful so that the pragmatic fascists, industrial fascists can take over. And that's literally what happened to Japan. The idealists, uh, there can be nothing more dangerous than an idealist because as long as you hew to your ideal, anything is acceptable, right? But the, the, the ones who took over from the mid 1930s used the excesses of the terrorists of the idealistic right to take over the country in the service of kind of an industrial militarism. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the idealists would have been against, not all, but some of them would have been against the um, atrocities committed against the Chinese. Uh, but the industrialists did not see the Chinese at any more as human, really. They were, you know, objects to be used. I'm, I'm reading about the slave trade right now, where Quakers, you know, the most pacifist people, um, would not allow profanity on their slave ships. <laughs> well, you got right? to decor them, you know. <laughs> right? You know, good merchants, right? Uh, uh, so, so once you dehumanize people, they are right. objects, objects of use. Those were the people who took over Japan after World War II to make common cause, and the Americans facilitated this, against communism, which I'm not denying was a terrible threat, and in its own way still is a threat. Right. But uh, so the Japanese school books, don't, they sort of stop at Meiji period. There is no real discussion in the school books about World War II. Mm. Um, so there's... Um, there's not much good education uh, for young people today about that. Interesting. So it did they not have a chance to reflect on it as a country then? Because it in a way, not. I mean, certainly some people have, but um, uh, and Japan is pretty much a militantly pacifist country in a lot of ways. The the majority of Japanese um, like the constitution that the Americans imposed, which um, ostensibly made Japan a non-military country. The fact is the Japanese self-defense force is not a military, but it's the fifth largest military in the world. Right. Um, <laughs> but but that said, um, to some degree, there was a, a kind of a reckoning, but it was never um, it was never full. And then the problem is um, the Chinese government deflects its own sins by getting the population focused on Japan. And, you know, uh, there is something corrupt about the Chinese government demands of Japan as well, uh, in terms of you did these things, and yet, you know, the, 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 the atrocities that the Chinese committed against their own people is, you know, perhaps the greatest level of atrocity in the world. But that's ignored to get the get the population focused on Japan. So, you know, so those Japanese who think about it very quickly get defensive, because if somebody attacks you from weak moral ground, it's very hard to listen to what they might have to say. Sure. Right. Yeah. So, so in that way, yeah, there's a you know. Uh, There's, there's a generational moral injury, which takes place, I think, in any country, but, you know, it's sort of highlighted, you know, in, in Japan right here. And actually, you know, my character Umezawa is in microcosm, uh, you know, and he's a character who finally ends up saying everything I've staked my life on is fundamentally corrupt. So once you say that, what's left, but tear the whole thing down. Right. I, I also, you know, as a theme in the book, uh, one of the things I kind of noticed, maybe it's just because of the, the, the way the story is kind of flipping back and forth, is a, I'm going to use the word, a civilized version of everything, and then the wild version of everything. It kind of like... Mm -hmm gives it as a counterpoint to each other, too. So I, I want to really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, you have a character, Tachibana, who is 
trying to find a way to negotiate survival within a highly structured society. How can she maintain any integrity, not only as a human, but as a woman in such a society? Um, whereas Umezawa is, he's throwing himself into radical freedom. And which it can be a terrible thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's, he forgets himself in his own terms a couple times, but then even within that wildness, you know, he, tr he transgresses against a taboo and he loses paradise. Sure. Because there are rules even there. Right. And what I wanted to do also was highlight, um, when you have perhaps the freest person is a psychopath. And, you know, so what happens to a person who attempts to hold some sort of morality when you are offered freedom? And freedom in that case means just sort of unleashing every desire, every everything that comes up from your unconscious, all that all that hate, all that aggression, all that whatever. And, you know, I, I uh, uh, in my own way, I grew to love those characters as well. You know, the, the, the Redbeard and uh, uh, Dark Lady. Yeah. Who are absolutely awful people, right? Beyond awful. And yet. There's that something that's attractive about that ultimate freedom. There really is. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's why we've always been fascinated by pirates. Yeah, there you go. And you know, you think of the movie Pirates of the Caribbean and you get Johnny Depp, the, the character, right? Imagine that guy move next door to you and wants to ask your 17 year old daughter out on a date right right <laughs> yeah it's like we like the idea but the reality is like mm, yeah no i'm not gonna do that we always choose the more civilized part of it yeah 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 well um let me say i love this book uh it started off kind of as a martial arts adventure but then very quickly as you're reading it you start peeling away those onion layers and you can get to a lot of different things on that one. Mm -hmm. um, so I highly recommend it to everybody that's listening to this one. And, and we'll have, you know, the the links and everything on that. Before we end up this, uh, I, I do want to ask you, because I read an interview with you uh, in, in uh, Shibumi magazine. Mm. And they were talking about something that you were involved in. Uh, Budo Accelerate, I believe was the name of it. Oh. Where you're, I don't how how I say it. it it's uh, a non-denominational martial arts instruction for uh, uh, high school students. Is that what it is? High school and middle school students. Okay, so so interesting. Let me. You, the first idea came from Josh Gold, who is an Aikido teacher, Ikazuchi Dojo down in uh, South LA. I can't remember names of places, um, and. The, you know, when you, you hear about teaching martial arts to kids, what do you usually hear? Um, things like teaching kids discipline, teaching, helping kids with their self-esteem, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, in a way, there's too much self-esteem these days, for unearned self-esteem. Yes, right? I agree. Right? I um, teach my <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and. One of the other things you you see a lot of is this whole safe space idea, safety, right? I want to be safe, right? So if you, as a high school teacher, express an idea that uh, uh, offends a student or challenges their own beliefs or goes against whatever is politically correct today, might not be tomorrow, but today, uh, you can get swarmed. Uh, kids are f afraid of each other, right? So the concept of Budo Accelerator is teaching leadership through martial arts. And it's a combination of actually teaching kids skills. And because it, it started out to Josh as an Aikido guy and um, Mark Tursik, who's the other of the three founders, I'm kind of one of the original, uh, start out, the, the idea was gonna be through Aikido and then COVID hit. So a lot of it had to be by Zoom. And so one thing that we could teach by Zoom was uh, uh, patterns of uh, Kali. Uh, 
I'm so bad with names. I've forgotten. Uh, I regret this. I but I forgot the name of the guy. His first name's Mark, who teaches the colleague to the kids. Um, and so it was a combination where they could teach, learn some Aikido and Kali, but it was always framed about leadership. And so there would be modules and the idea would be, and I would present like sort of concepts like Ukemi, uh, bouncing back, mm. right? You fall down, so you bounce up, right? Resilience, um, being able to take the hit, being able to make a mistake, being able to um, establish safety in unsafe situations. These are all essential qualities of leadership. Uh, perspective taking, seeing the other person's perspective without adopting it, which requires curiosity in another person, right? Which requires the ability to establish dialogue. Right. So we started working with high school kids and we're also working with college kids. And it's a, a, it's a program of a certain number of months. The goal is you want the kids to then filter into the regular martial arts dojo, you know, to keep going. Um, it's what we're trying to do is establish the, um, in a sense, a package is the wrong word, but we'll use it for now, uh, a lesson plan of what is required to make this work. So somebody from another martial art, from karate, from uh, 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 judo, from BJJ, you could do the same thing with kids. One of the most important things though, is the teachers are absolutely forbidden to try to impose an ideology on the kids. So, if a kid comes to you and says, uh, you know, as part of this program and says, um, I really want to learn how to be a leader because I'm really pro-life and I want to start an organization in my school, uh, which is pro-life. I really think that abortion is a terrible thing. Sure. And the teacher's role, who may be adamantly pro-choice, pro is we'll help you do that. We'll help you develop the skills to do that. And one of the things that happens is because that's our frame, we've got kids from all walks of life. Because this was Zoom, uh, you know, one of the other things was this is not a program for at-risk youth. Right. <laughs> I, you know, I'm so, uh, me personally, I'm so tired of that um, almost patronizing attitude of going to help the natives. Mm, Sorry, yeah. but I, I, it, it just grates on me. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a program of teaching leadership, you will have kids from rich homes and poor homes in the same program. And because it was online all over the country, we had kids so poor that they wouldn't turn on the video feed on their Zoom because they didn't want anybody to see their house. Yeah. Yep. But all those kids became friends and there was mutual respect, which was developed uh, amongst all those kids who had very different viewpoints, um, as much as those viewpoints were, were, ver were, were uh, verbalized. Right. Right? Um, so the goal is no ideology other than we can all be brothers and sisters on the map. And we can learn about strength and acquire the strength to be a leader or to fit in an organization comfortably through practice in adversity. And what martial arts provide is a laboratory to study emotions like anger, or fear, uh, getting tripped out on being so happy you no longer take care of yourself, or you're, you know, just like we can be unwise in physical expression, we can be unwise in verbal expression too. Have you ever been in a situation where you're having too much fun and you say something you wish you hadn't said, yes. right? right? <laughs> And so think about the same thing happening on the mat, right? You're having so much fun, you forget that your training partner told you five minutes ago, they've got a, a, a bruised wrist, uh, don't torque the left wrist or don't hit the left side or whatever it is, right? So any emotion taken to an extreme uh, can throw us off center. And so Budo helps us develop equanimity while in adversity, mm. and 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 which we th we think is like absolutely fundamental to leadership, right? 
So there is a website for Budo Accelerator, just if people happen to be curious about that. I'm sorry, I don't have the URL off the top of my head, but if you look up Budo Accelerator, you will find it in one okay. click. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll look it up and we'll make sure it's in the show notes for you too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, okay, then uh, on that note, do you, do you, in order to get the books, where would someone get the book that we were talking about or any of your other books that you have? What, this is your plug time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my plug time. Okay. Um, well, first of all, Amazon is often the best way to go because okay. what everyone thinks about, you know, the octopus that is Amazon that devours everything, it also reaches everywhere. So people can pay local postage rates in Japan or Australia and get my work. Okay. Um, if you look up my name, pretty much not all, but almost every all a book I've written is through Amazon. They can also get a lot of them through Kobo, the, the online version, or through iBook. Uh, if you go to my website, um, which is edgeworkbooks.com, E-D-G-E-W-O-R-K-B-O-O-K-S.com, edgeworkbooks.com, uh, that's got a list and a description of all my books and links to all the places to buy them. Okay, well, again, Thank you for doing this. This is the third time I've talked to you, and every single time I'm I'm fascinated. <laughs> There's so much I learn every single time I talk to you, which is a good thing. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, we ended up not talking a lot about the plot of the book, which is actually good because you can be surprised. <laughs> no, um, no, that means everyone has to read it to figure it out. <laughs> right. Um, just as wet people's appetite, um, I do embed. Uh, it's almost like a puzzle, like Hidden in Plain Sight, as one of my books is called. I embed some pretty core, sophisticated martial arts techniques in not only the fight scenes, but the training stuff. And you could actually pick up something on page whatever that you could use to enhance your own training, uh, in addition to going 100 years in the past and going to a pretty marvelous world. Well, now I'm going to have to try that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give a big, huge thanks to Elisander Sensei for sharing his wisdom and knowledge on martial arts. And if you're listening to this here at the end with me, I know you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you want to see the show notes for this or any of the other episodes, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you own a martial arts school, Jeremy has a zero obligation look at consulting services that he offers where the average martial arts school sees a positive return on their investments in just three months. If you want to find out about that, go to whistlekick.com and click the consulting tab. If you're interested in having Jeremy come teach at your school, personally, I've seen him teach. I've learned from him. He has a really good intuition for breaking down skills and developing drills to work on those ideas. Let him know if you want him to come teach at your school. Email him at jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's going to break up. Uh, that's going to end up our show here. And until next time, train hard, smile, have a great day, and keep thinking those martial thoughts. <laughs>